Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me welcome you to Chat with Matt. Uh, the purpose of Chat with Matt is to find uh, interesting speakers uh, to uh, educate you about some important topic. Uh, and today we have uh, Mike Lorelli joining us. Uh, Mike and I are old friends. We've known each other for quite some time, and uh, that makes the conversation easier. Mike is one of our uh, resident in the, in the United States, resident experts on private equity, and uh, you're going to enjoy hearing all the things that uh, he has to say. So Mike, why don't we uh, kick things off? Uh, my experience has been that people introduce me and always butcher my background. And uh, why don't you uh, let us know a little bit about uh, where you come from and uh, how you got there? Okay, so uh, the 30 second elevator speech is very blessed to have been a PepsiCo president twice, followed by five private equity uh, engagements, including an operating partner role. And that's 22 seconds. And that's all that anybody needs. Okay. So, you know, if you could, uh, you came from big corporate. Uh, maybe you could share with us a few of your uh, surprises when you uh, started doing private equity type engagements. Yeah. So um, I think... A couple of these will pop up in the course of the other questions that you've got uh, from your clientele here, Matt. But I would say the big picture is uh, I never envisioned it to be so invigorating, so intellectually engaging, so diverse, and financially so plentiful. And the only point I'll embellish on is uh, when I say so diverse in the private equity world, typically you've got your foot in four different sectors, uh, you know, businesses, you know, in the course of a 24 hour day. And then I just have to say that that is just very intellectually engaging. So um, all of these have been a ton of fun, but I have to say it's a lot of work. Uh, but the backside is it's very financially rewarding. So uh, I guess one should go with the other. And in my case, it did. I'm very blessed. No, that's that's all good stuff. I, I think uh, that was uh, my corporate experience as well, to a degree when moving from a large company to a small, uh, it's uh, more intellectually challenging because you don't have as many resources. You have to kind of invent it on your own. Well, you know, my favorite line is when I get interviewed uh, to go be a CEO for a private equity company, one of the points I deliberately find a way to inject in the conversation uh, is that uh, all of the companies I've run on the private equity side, very mm -hmm. slim uh, and mean on the P&L and SG&A side, you know, uh, we've had no staffs, you know, we had no admins, we had no receptionist. There was a poster in the lobby that said, you know, Matt Bud extension 207. Um, and that's the way we ran it. Uh, and then three o'clock in the afternoon, if we needed stuff from Staples because we had a bank meeting tomorrow, Mike, would, uh, who looked like he was the least busy guy, the CEO, would run down the hallways and say, Staples, Staples, does anybody need anything? And Mike would drive to Staples. Uh, and when I told that anecdote, which is a true story uh, from my experience with one of my companies, boy, does that ring true for the PE people who put a 10 or an 11 or a 12 in front of every cost number. That's how much EBITDA, you know, you're, you're translating it to, you know, on the exit side. Sure, sure. Uh, I would assume that you found your corporate, your corp, large corporate experience, however, did give you a lot of tools. Well, it gave you the big picture, Matt. And um, so the example here would be lean manufacturing. I mean, Pepsi was really cool uh, on Lean and Six Sigma. And we studied from GE, you know, who was not quite down the street, but almost, and we were, we were friends uh, as companies. Uh, so we learned a lot from them. But the advantage of having the big company background is that you know what it looks like when it's done right with precision and it's done to scale. And you could walk into a manufacturing plant and inside of 90 seconds, size up whether or not this is a candidate for lean manufacturing. Now, I've had three instances where this has happened to me. I walked into a plant 
inside of 90 seconds, I said, wait a second. I just watched this cap come in from a loading dock being offloaded onto the dock from a truck. This cap went to station A to station B. It got filled, it got put on a bottle in station D, uh, and then it went out the door in station E. That cap just traveled a quarter of a mile. This is a candidate for lean manufacturing. There are three gross margin points just sitting on the floor waiting to be scooped up. So mm -hmm. that's the advantage big company people have is they could walk in with that kind of background, size these things up, cut to the chase, and make phenomenal dents uh, in the EBITDA and hence enterprise value of these small cap private equity companies, Matt. So I think that's a good segue into the qualities. You've hired some uh, CFOs for your portfolio companies. Uh, what qualities do you look for in a CFO? Yeah, yeah. so Matt, I would say um, on the higher portion of my list would be qualitative things. Oh, okay. I want a CEO, a CFO rather, who can shadow me, who can be my coach, who could be my wing person, um, who could basically take my 100 day plan and push it ahead faster than I could push it ahead. Now, Matt, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take a two minute digression because in the private equity space, uh, it's all about time. And if anybody read uh, the articles that Matt pushed out uh, my one on the private equity versus traditional CEO, which I was very flattered to be asked to have written about what's the difference between someone who's successful in one versus the other. The essence of that article basically is time. That's what PE is all about. The average hold period for a company is five years. Now, the bad news is, I have to tell you, that if you take a role in a private equity company, you know, you're not going to be there in year six because success for them is likely to be that they turned and had a nice profit, you know, somewhere between year three, four, five at the latest, or rarely six uh, and beyond. So you got to kind of think of yourself a little bit as having the half-life of uranium. <laughs> yeah. you know, meaning you're, you're disappearing a little bit every day. But if you don't have the stomach for that kind of career path, private equity is not where you want to be. So, you know, that's a very, very important distinction. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, it's been said, a lot of the, I've had some uh, search assignments for private equity groups and oftentimes they, they're almost insistent that someone have private equity experience. I think part of it is the, um, just the mindset, right? That. Uh, private equity people are expected to have. But in your opinion, I, I would assume it's not absolutely essential. The tools well, um, no. And, you know, so I didn't have my first private equity engagement until a private equity firm said that, hey, you know what? Mike's a smart guy and he could figure it out. So if we could just click for a second here, Matt, sure. and I apologize. I'm just oh. uh, looking for the slide here. I think you and I had it here a couple of minutes ago, slide 22, which basically says that 43% of the people uh, in private equity today are in their first engagement. So um, it should never be said that you have to have private equity experience. Smart people can figure things out. There's no rocket science about this. It's more the chemistry, the way you go about it. And Matt, it, it, it reverts back to your early, earlier question, which was, I think, the most insightful one, which is, what do you look for in the qualities? So when we are approaching buying a company, okay, we're one of three bidders. We've now documented our 100-day plan which spells out with little uncertainty exactly what we're going to do from day one, almost minute by minute, what we're going to do in marketing, finance, sales, administration, mm -hmm. et cetera, the home office, the rent, the payroll, but this and that spells out exactly how we are going to extract extraneous cost out, bring that to the bottom line and the exit valuation, 
We do that with painful detail. It's called the 100 day plan. And that is done before we buy the company. Now, on closed date, we attack that plan religiously, piece by piece by piece. So I think the best answer, the better answer to your first insightful question, Matt, is that the best thing a CFO can do for a CEO is to help him make that 100-day plan happen, take the, take the, the weight off of his shoulders, do the effort for him, be ahead of the game, push the CEO along where he needs to be pushed so that that 100-day plan is delivered. So in a, in a sense here, uh, having all the tools, having worked for a large company and learning all the tools, like, as you were saying, lean manufacturing, uh, Six Sigma, uh, those are good tools. And now suddenly you can actually apply them and see the results. It's a nice place to be for a CFO. I think it could be an incredibly emotionally, aside from financially, rewarding position because you can make so much change happen. Uh, and if you're coupled with a good CEO who's willing to listen uh, and take you as their wing person, uh, I mean, there, there isn't a better marriage. So, you know, getting picked for these uh, assignments, uh, we can, if you want to, I know you like to talk about your LinkedIn profile and how to, what, what, why it's important. So I have, we, we have a slide that, to share with you. Hold on. And I think it's. Page yeah. 26. Yeah. And then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use uh, this perfect Matt. Thank you. 26, we're going to use 27 and 28 also. So I will tell you that probably 70% of the private equity openings at senior levels are found from people's LinkedIn profiles. You wow. grab one of the newly minted MBAs uh, and you say, we need a new VP of real estate. Uh, Harry Schmaltz uh, resigned surprisingly this morning. Here are the keywords. Go find me a dozen people, print out page one of their LinkedIn profile, bring them to me. I'm gonna skim those profiles and i'll tell you which two i would like you to fly in uh, to be candidates for that assignment i cannot tell you how important that linkedin profile is in my consulting practice which people can go to it's www.fasterlandings.com the biggest point i tell people is when i interview a new prospective client and I ask them how much time they spend on their resume and how good you think it is. The answer almost always is, I put 40 hours in. I think it's terrific. And I say, you know what? That's great. And I agree, it is terrific. And then I ask, how good do you think your LinkedIn profile is? How much time did you put in? The typical answer is, you know, it's okay. I put about an hour and a half in. Someday I'm going to get around to uh, to, to, to up up. Uh, up leveling a little bit. And I say, you got the, the world completely upside down. My coaching advice to you is create a killer LinkedIn profile and then take the next 29 days of the year off. Now, the arithmetic is very simple. You know, there are 720 million LinkedIn members. So if you've got an average profile, you're one in 70,000. You're never going to be found. If you've got an excellent profile, which you probably are proud of, you're one of 700, you're still not going to be found. You probably should have not as well even been born. You're not going to be seen. You need a killer profile. You got to be one in the 70. Now, Matt, if we can quickly click forward, uh, and then I'm going to give people the Cliff Notes version uh, of my life to date learnings on LinkedIn. 80% of the LinkedIn algorithm traction comes down to getting two things right. So keep this in mind. You only have to do two things right. This will only take you two hours. The headline is A and the about section is B. The headline gives you 150 available characters uh, and the words, the keywords that you're using should be separated by these spike bars, okay? 
Um, most people use forward slashes or bullets. The algorithm doesn't know how to read forward slashes and bullets. The algorithm understands that a spike bar uh, means what's to the left is a different expression than what's to the right. So that's oh. the first of the two parts on the LinkedIn profile. So Matt, let's just page forward to uh, the, uh, uh, the next it. page. Okay. Uh, and then the about section, which gives you about 2,400 characters today, they keep upping it a little bit. The best approach for the about section is give us a really crisp, concise elevator speech, as Matt Budd would always tell you. Do it in two or three sentences. Start with that. Then follow that very crisp elevator speech with two or three bullets that tell the world what separates you from 5,000 other people. Now, for those of you who are looking at this slide, ignore this first one about invading China. That's an inside joke in private equity written by a very revered uh, uh, private equity founder, John Rutledge, since retired. Uh, so people in PE get it, name it, ignore it. If you look at the, the continued bullets, it says CEO interim CEO. It says accredited outside director. It says landing board seats coach. Those are Mike's three subheads. And then on each of them, I go on and I prove it. I give the evidence. Mike's ability to drive revenue spans 30 years, PepsiCo divisions, blah, 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 blah. He's an accredited outside director. Uh, he's uh, on the board of the American College of Corporate Directors, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and he's a landing board seats coach. So if someone is looking for a board member, Matt, let's just click back for one second. My headline is sticky here uh, for board searches. It says outside director. It also says board coach. And then if we click forward uh, again, uh, yep. Uh, uh, you can see in my opening elevator speech, you know, I've got those points encapsulated. Uh, and then two or, or three of my call outs talk about me as an outside director. So uh, if a recruiter is looking for a board member, as an example, or in my earlier premise, someone looking for a real estate VP, if these are the key words that he punched in, there is a very high likelihood that Mike Lorelli is going to get a call. Now, I'll punchline this by saying that in the last uh, 30 years, I've generally been on three or four boards. Uh, and I will tell you, better than half of those engagements came about because a recruiter or a private equity firm had an opening, gave the assignment to one of their newly minted MBAs, gave them the keywords. You know, I got one of the 10 pages that was printed out. I got flown in uh, and that landed to an offer. So the most important thing I could say by far is to perfect your LinkedIn profile, spend 60 hours on that, don't spend another minute on your resume. Sorry for being so winded, but I, Mike, I just Mike, love that question. Mike, I have a question. I saw on your LinkedIn profile that you talked about yourself in the third person. And I was always under the impression that it should, you wouldn't say Mike, you wouldn't say I, you would just use the verb. So, you know, the... Uh, runs this runs that because it's your linkedin profile and yeah. so uh what is your thoughts okay um peggy that i'm so glad you brought that question up uh, and i was going to bring it up if you didn't so i'm glad you put that on the table there are two schools of thought and i would say the population is roughly 50 50 so there's a very interesting debate um i believe if you say, I, 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 I did this, I accomplished this, I eliminated, I improved, I, 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 you sound very braggadocious. You sound a little Donald Trumpish, as opposed to if somebody else is saying it, Mike has accomplished this, Mike achieved this, Mike brought this division you know, under control, he made this acquisition, eliminated one plant. If somebody else is saying it, it's got more credibility because it's coming from a third party. 
Yes, there are two schools of thought. There are actually articles written on both ways to do this. I happen to have, so I'm, I'm being balanced here and telling you there are two schools of thought uh, and the world is 50-50. Yeah. I happen to be very strongly in favor of putting it in the third person, have somebody else say things about you as opposed to Donald Trump saying, I'm great. Well, you know, my, my um, indoctrination was, you shouldn't say I either, because I totally agree. If I'm saying I, then it does look like you're bragging. But if you if you eliminate the word I and says achieve this, accomplish that, did that, you've left out I, and it just states what you did. I think the most important thing is to be consistent. And there are people who I've seen resumes where they go back and forth. So let's move on. Uh, money is important. Why don't we talk about? Uh, you said you can make a lot of money. Uh, let's share with everybody uh, what that means. Yeah, uh, and that's why we're in the game. So let me just quickly revert here for one second, Matt, to... Yeah, it's slide 24. Slide 24 is exactly where we want to go and where you are. So I will tell you, I have never made in my five CEO private equity engagements cash what I made as a Pepsi president, either in terms of base uh, or bonus. Both were well shy of what I made. And I'm going to guess that would be the case for virtually all of the members you've got on this call today, Matt. Mm -hmm. Now, but where we make up for it uh, is in the equity position. I could sure tell you as a Pepsi president, I sure didn't have 5% of PepsiCo stock, but in every one of the small and mid-cap private equity firms that I've run, for me to have a five or more percent equity participation would be usual, not unusual. So there is where you have the ability uh, to make several million dollars. I have got many friends that have made 10, $15 million you know, working on an engagement for three years, not even five years on the private equity side. So the equity piece is what it's all about. And, and if that arithmetic, you know, doesn't make you comfortable, you know, this may not be the place for you. So we, we could, we should talk here about uh, the, the look before you leap thing. And uh, uh, there, it is possible you're going to be hired as a CFO for a private equity portfolio company that's sort of uh, moved along the curve that maybe they're, you know, they're prepared to sell it in the next year or two. Just something you should ask about, right? Yeah. So um, let me just go, uh, Matt, if I can. Uh, and I want to make one other point here. I'm making myself a mental note. Um, let's go to slide. Give me one second, Matt. I apologize. Slide three. And, ah, sure. um, and uh, I don't see that on the screen yet. Yeah. Um, so this explains the continuum. Uh, and there is a world of a difference between VC and PE. And, and many people think they're one and the same uh, and actually use the terms interchangeably. Nothing can be more wrong. I mean, VC is dealing with something that could be simple as an idea. I want to create a taxi service, you know, uh, uh, using GPS. Uh, and I'm going to have people drive their own cars. I'm winding back the clock 10 years. It could be nothing more than an idea. It could be a molecule in the test tube. It could be a product that's in test market in Syracuse. Uh, but invariably in all those situations, it's losing money. It's burning cash. They've got investors who believe in the future that think it's going to be the next Google, uh, you know, the next uh, Apple, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to make a gazillion dollars. Now, if you slide all the way to the right, I'm going to skip the middle for a moment here. You've got mature companies, things that have proven that they can make money 
and they can make cash. They can build cash, not just use cash. Now, the biggest difference between, I get asked this in every seminar I give, my live seminars, is, well, what's the dividing line between VC and PE? And I say, well, the dividing line is making cash. <laughs> you know, if you've passed the point of being burning cash to the point where you're making cash, well, now you're in the PE space. So that's the difference between the two worlds. They're very different. I don't operate in the VC space. I operate exclusively in the PE space. They're very different. The characteristics are very different. But I do have to add the point. In the VC community, in the VC community, the accepted statistic is that one in 39 startups will make it to cash flow neutral. One in 39. That is their statistic. One in 39 will make it the cash flow neutral. Now, people chase it because it could be the next Google, the next Apple, the next whatever, and you could make yourself a gazillionaire. But the statistics are it's one in 39. You need to understand that uh, and where you're going to spend your time in terms of the rest of your career. Without my elaborating anymore, I think I've slightly hinted at my personal bias, even though I have been part of some PE situations. All right. So the, the, the dividing line is once you're into positive cash, private equity might be interested in it. Yeah. Yeah. To the left of it, PE, no. Right. And, but again, it's uh, it, you're wise to ask if you're joining a portfolio company that's already been a part of a private equity group for a while, what stage they're in. Yeah. So, and that, yeah. And then uh, part B, I'm sorry, I didn't answer it uh, as well as I should have, Matt. Part B uh, to your question is, you know, you should ask, what's your expected hold period? Where are you now in the hold period? Now, it's got many ramifications. If they tell you, we just bought it eight months ago uh, and the CEO cashed out, but he agreed to stick around for a year until we got our arms around the business and now we're recruiting a CEO or, and, and he's going to bring in a CFO. Okay, or all those are good colorful signals. Um, and uh, um, if they tell you, well, it's in year four uh, and we typically have a five-year hold period, you know, that raises a whole list of other questions. You know, what kind of guarantees are you going to give me? And I think this is very important in terms of contract negotiations, right? In the case of the former, if a CFO said, uh, okay, I'm fine on the base uh, and the bonus uh, and the equity, uh, but I want a three-year contract. Uh, in the case of the former where they just bought it uh, and you ask for a three-year contract, you know, they're going to laugh in your face and say, on what grounds are you asking for a three-year contract? On the other hand, if they tell you this is in year four, we just can the CFO and the CEO. They were both not the right people for the company. We're recruiting both. We still expect to hold it for another year and a half. Man, you've got very good grounds to insist on a three-year severance clause. And when they say, what are you smoking, Harry? Your answer should be, hey, wait a second. You're only going to own this thing for another 18 months. I have no idea who my next boss is going to be. I have to have a three-year severance clause to protect my family. Good words to use. So yeah. knowing oh, where sorry. they are in the whole period and what their expectation is, is very critical in the way you think about the company and also crucial in terms of the way you negotiate your, your, your contract. So let, let's clarify a few things. A lot of people think private equity money comes from fat cats. Uh, that's simply not true. Yeah, so let's uh, flip back quickly here. Um, I no, love this conversation. Just, yeah. Mostly they, they solicit money from- uh, Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're pension funds, they're endowment funds. You know, it's, uh, it's my PepsiCo retirement money, you know, being put away uh, in a pension fund. Uh, and they're all very, very stable investments. Uh, and that's very different than the public perception, which unfortunately is that PE is a bunch of fat cats, fat cats uh, in the corner of a room smoking a smelly cigar 
if we go to slide 10, if we can, Matt, and if we can't, that's okay. Just for one second, we could pull up the actual data. Now we're gonna push these slides out to the participants afterward. If you want. Yeah, yeah, we should. Uh, so this slide shows exactly uh, where the money comes from that we get to go invest. And you can say the biggest slug is public pension funds. I mean, we all know these things are underfunded. Uh, they're never going to close the gap in their lifetime. They try real hard to start closing the gap. And the way they generally do that is year by year, they invest more and more in the private equity sector. And CalPERS is probably the best case in point here. I mean, yeah. if you look back CalPERS year to year to year to year, every year, a bigger slice of their pie is invested with private equity limited partners like myself. Yeah, so the, the uh, companies, um, uh, we, were t we, we pushed out something on the disappearance of public companies. Perhaps you'd like to just briefly address that. Yeah, uh, uh, boy, Matt, you bring it, up all the It's a shocking statistic, actually. <laughs> yeah, so um, Matt, were we able to push out those two articles? I just yes, don't we did. To... People have oh, okay, seen good. It. Yeah. But yes. you know, especially the general point. Yeah. So if people have seen the article that I wrote, this is a great story. It's going to take me four minutes. Um, uh, when I was running Accent Foods last year as the interim CEO, um, I bumped in. We had two in-house recruiters. Uh, and I bumped into two of them in the cafeteria one day. And I said, hey, what's new? And they say, boy, we, we're having a hard time recruiting. Well, why is that? Well, because we're PE owned and that scares the daylights out of people. I said, hold on a second. Exactly the opposite should be the case. PE is the best thing to put on your resume um, for its value going forward. And, and then I went on to give them the statistics that, uh, and this goes back to the Wall Street Journal article. Um, and I don't think it was in here, Matt. Um, no, we sent it out to everybody. Yeah. Um, famous article. November 17th of 2017 was the date and the year. The, it was an op-ed piece that went on to say that 40 years ago, there were, were 8,000 public companies in the U.S. with over, four, over 500 million in sales. But as of that particular date, November 17th, uh, 2017, there were only 3,671 left. Phenomenal difference uh, yep. in the size of that boat. Now, why did that happen? Well, simply because every day you open the Wall Street Journal, Raytheon has bought so-and-so, Boeing has bought so-and-so. There's one less public company. So that's pretty simple. That's why all that's happened. I right. wish the author, I still have the article, and I'm, he's a private equity guy. I'm going to call him up and buy him lunch. And I want to do two things. I want to thank him for a phenomenal op-ed piece, which really was an eye-opener. When most people read that 8,000 to 3,671, they said, this has got to be a typo. It can't be true. But it was real. But I want to also make a point to him gently that I wish this article would have gone on to say and that same 40 year time horizon, while all that M&A was going on, the private equity piece exploded from virtually zero to 16,000 uh, private equity owned portfolio companies. Yep. So just look at the relative size of the two buckets today. 3,671 public, 16,000 private, private equity. So if you want to fish where the fish are, and there are only 24 hours in the day, and you've got to get at least four hours sleep, I would say devote a lot of your time toward the private equity space. And I would say having it on your resume is golden. Yeah. And that's where the, uh, that's where the money is. And that's where the jobs are. They, they, and the fun. Yeah. You know, and you don't go backwards, you know, um, um, you get the big company experience uh, and then you go into private equity and you develop the agility 
uh, and you put the two pieces together uh, and it's just a terrific combo plan. You have to put your toolbox to work. Yeah, Mike, somebody would like you while you're talking about this to discuss the difference between being granted equity versus buying in to the equity participation. Yeah, so Peggy, uh, this is a very intriguing question and good interview prep. Somewhere along the line, you're a candidate to be the CEO, CFO of XYZ. Uh, and you're in your last conversation with the PE firm and you've already fallen in love with one another. Uh, and they're gonna say to you, you know, uh, uh, Geraldine, uh, we're not stingy. Um, the company on paper today, it's in year two, is worth 10% more than what we paid for it. So the shares are worth more. We're not greedy. We'd like to cut you in so you can feel the pain and be an equity participant from day one. Now, Peggy, <laughs> there are two subparts, subparts to this question. Part one is they're going to say, so how big of a check do you think you might write? And I would say your answer to that question should be a minimum of 100,000. Uh, if it's lower than that, it signals that you're not serious, you're not willing to lose sleep, or for whatever reason, life to date, you haven't made very much money, which would be a, not a good signal of success. So once you give them the answer to that question, let's say you said $100,000. The next question that's gonna immediately follow it is gonna be, what percentage of your life to date liquid assets does that represent? Exclude the boat, the plane, the house. That 100,000 represents what of your liquidity? Now, if the answer to that is 5%, they're gonna say, this lady is not gonna lose a lot of sleep worrying about our company. If the answer is 15%, they're gonna say, you know, um, this woman, um, is going to, you know, come in on the weekends uh, and be losing sleep on the holidays thinking about the company. So I, I absolutely love that question, Peggy. That's the way it's phrased. There's always a two-part question, uh, and those are the two ways to answer it. Is, is it a knockout, do you think, Mike, if you're not willing to put up any money? Yes. Or you don't have money to put yeah. up? Uh, it's, it says, it basically says you're a life-to-date failure. I hate to say it so bluntly, okay. you know, if you've got no money. So I've been involved with uh, private equity people for a long time, uh, almost 20 years. And uh, I, the, the whole industry has really transformed uh, over the years from uh, financial engineering to uh, value creation. I see this when I go to the, uh, I used to go to the private equity um, uh, operating partners meeting. Yeah. They were disrespected people 10 years ago and now uh, they're the stars. Well. Um... The point you're raising is that um, let's let's just talk about boards for a second here, and then I want to spend a minute on boards later. The typical private equity portfolio company has a board with five people: the CEO, three people from the PE firm, so they have control, you know, and an outside director or two. Okay because you need an outside director or two to be on the audit committee and the comp committee. Otherwise, there's no legitimacy uh, to the governance. So the bad news, not necessarily bad news, is that the three PEs by definition, and I say this with a smile on my face, and I really hope I don't offend anybody on this call, but the three PE people are typically, I apologize, the stereotype, Wharton Finance MBA with their HP calculator. So when they're looking to add that outside director or two or three, they're looking for people that have some operating experience. Sure. You know, that doesn't mean they've been a CEO. That doesn't mean they've been a COO. That means they've actually been in the engine room. Uh, and that's where just about everybody you know, on this call is incredibly valuable because you've been in the engine room. You know what it's like to stress and strain and make the EBITDA for the month, for the quarter, you know, for the year. So um, that's kind of what the board composition is like. And the reason why people that have operating experience 
not necessarily CEO, COO, general manager, but you've been in the engine room are extraordinarily important to private equity people. Yeah, so we, we I think that the lack of properties to buy has, has increased multiples and there's more pressure, right? To, to create a return. You can't just financially engineer your way out of it. it. Used to be, they just put debt on the balance sheet and they were done. Yeah. So, you know, that was a long time ago, right? <laughs> well, yeah, but, um, you know, the war continues. If we could go to um, 29 and then 30, Matt, for a second here, if we still have the electronics to do that, um, we refer to money that's been pledged by CalPERS, right? Arizona State Retirement Fund. Uh, whatever it is, money that's been pledged. Uh, we, you know, that's money that's sitting on the sidelines and earning zero, you know, um, and um, it truly is earning zero. Uh, and until it gets deployed, meaning the private equity firm found a couple, couple of companies to buy, it's earning zero. And that's the reason why the purchase multiples just continue to increase. I look at 11.4x today and I say to myself, you know, Mike, you know, in your lifetime, this is never going to come down, you know, barring another financial disaster, you know, it's just, it's just not going to come down because oh. there's this incredible bidding war because there's so much of this, what we call dry powder sitting in the sideline that basically is earning zap until the private equity firm buys a company, sends you an email, says, here's the wire instructions. You bought readers. Here's our hundred thousand, hundred million dollars. Yeah. So uh, how many, uh, you mentioned the venture capitalists are, uh, they're looking for, what was it? One out of 40 to pay off? One out of, 30, to one out of 39. That's, that's their stat, not mine. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in private equity terms, uh, uh, you had a slide on how many you, you uh, how, yeah, how yeah. So in the spirit okay, of, um, really full the yeah, in the spirit of full That's disclosure, two out of the uh, park. Yeah. Let me just see um, which page we had here, Matt. Um, I don't know that we kept this page in the deck or not, but um, no, oh, matter. here we go. Uh, it's slides 13. So if we could pull 13 up here, Matt. Sure. Um, this is interesting. Uh, it's enlightening. It's embarrassing. It's enriching. <laughs> Typically for a fund that goes out and says, we've raised a billion dollars. Here are our LPs. Uh, we're going to be in the consumer product space. We intend to buy 10 companies. We expect the life cycle of the fund, the total fund to be 10 years. But uh, each company we expect to own about five years. Here would be the typical result. This is the average. Two out of the park. I mean, like we blew the doors off. Okay. Then a bunch of, day, of you know, hits, <laughs> base hits, uh, and even singles count. And two, the bank took the car keys. You know, a uh, key bank calls up Mike and says, hey, Mike, you've been in violation of your loan covenants at Rita's Italian Ice is now for three consecutive quarters. The loan agreement says we could take possession of the company. We're going to go do that. As a, and Today's Friday. As of Monday morning, we're going to come in, fire your CEO and CFO. We've hired Alvarez and Marcel, and we've tasked them to take the body parts apart uh, and get the maximum return they can get trying to get us as close as they can to a hundred cents on a dollar. So I've spent too much time on the last bullet there, but those are the facts. But in spite right. of so those from, facts- From a standpoint of you getting hired at a private equity group portfolio company, there is, it's not a guaranteed uh, run. No. So- I mean, that's you where you go gotta, in with your eyes open, the, the you value gotta, of the company and whether you can make a difference. Would you agree? That's that's where you gotta earn your due. That's where you 
Uh, and I put the two people together that joined at the hip, the CEO, the CFO. Um, they are partners, you know, in delivering uh, the 100 day plan and all the other elements that are going to make the deal thesis prove correct uh, and make this a double. Uh, a single is okay, triple even better. Uh, I'm not going to hope for out of the park, uh, but certainly not a casualty where the bank calls you up. Yeah. So I th thought another interesting point you made was uh, on how much it's, even though there isn't a lot to, uh, to buy these days, uh, the private equity groups really go to a lot of, uh, they do a lot of research and a lot of hunting. Yeah. You know, and this is terribly I don't think people understand how much hunting they do. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and Matt, that's the insight. Um, I will look at 300 teasers a year. A teaser is a one pager prepared by the investment banker who's representing the sale. I'll look at 300 a, a year. I will sign the confidentiality agreement on 100 saying, send me the book. Uh, and when he sends me the book electronically, that's a four hour read. I will read three of those a week. That's three nights a week that I've crashed reading books. I'll sign seven LOIs. I will go in physically uh, and spend on my watch uh, accounting and legal time doing due diligence on two to get one over the finish line. So let's just think about this. 300 teasers to get one over the finish line. And that's what we refer to as the funnel. Now, the interesting point, Matt, if we could just put that slide back up for one second, oh, sure. is one of the questions you might ask when you're interviewing with a PE firm is, what's the shape of your funnel? And they tell you it's five to one. If we look at 500, we get one. I'd say, whoa, these people are probably pretty sharp. This sounds like they're very selective. And this sounds like a smart group. If they tell me it's 600 to one, I'd say these guys are chasing everything that moves. I don't know that this is the sharpest private equity group that I want to be affiliated with. Great question, Matt. Thank you. That's interesting. Way of judging the people you might be doing business with. Yep. 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 So as we're winding down here, we're into our last 12 minutes. Uh, perhaps you want to comment on what a SPAC is? Yeah, so um, the whole process. Yeah, so SPACs are uh, an interesting topic here, Matt. So let's revert to, give me just one nanosecond, but you're usually faster than I am. SPACs are a special purpose acquisition companies that actually don't own anything. Uh, but they say, you know what? We've got a, a strong combo platter. We've got two terrific people. Thanks, Pat. Two terrific people uh, from the uh, restaurant industry. We've got a great CEO who's been CEO of X, Y, and Z. We've got a great CFO who's worked with him once and twice for other CEOs. But he's got a great track record uh, in the restaurant space. We're going to go out and find a company. We don't know who it is. We're going to go out and find it. We want to raise a billion dollars in cash, but we can put on top of that probably 400 billion in, in, in debt, uh, and we can go out and create some, some interesting acquisitions. Now, the good news is that's a pretty broad statement. The bad news is all of those facts have a fixed time horizon. Legally, you need to make an acquisition in the first 24 months. Otherwise, all of that money uh, goes back to the shareholders. And candidly, you've just wasted a lot of time, your own time, a lot of other people's time. I, I am not a fan uh, of SPACs. I just, oh, uh, I just have to say, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, there's a question. What, what happens with the, the dry pot? You, you said if they don't invest, like, uh, Calpers, if they give you money and you don't, if you're not able to invest it, you, yeah. they have terms where you have to turn it back. Well, uh, it's legal that uh, after two years, 
if you haven't bought something, you've got to put the whole thing back uh, to the shareholders. So uh, mm -hmm. that's that's I can't think of a better expression uh, for a black eye. Uh, Mike, are there um, the question is uh, the largest, most reputable PE firms? Are these the ones you should be looking at? And what are they? Or is that not a factor? OK, uh, great question, Peggy. Now, give me a second here. I just want to uh, revert to one well, particular are, slide. Yeah, you had a list of uh, PE firms that are the big, the big kahunas. Yeah. But that's OK. Uh, you know, yeah. What, no, what but you know, for? yeah, I would say that um, rather than go after the big ones, they get all the attention and all the headlines. I would go after the ones that do more of the deals. So let's just go to nineteen I, I have for a it. second. So, as opposed to the ones that make the headlines, right? Uh, page uh, B2, Wall Street Journal. Uh, to me, a better list is who's doing a lot of transactions. Because if they're doing a lot of transactions, that means they probably are changing a lot of CEOs and the CEO typically changes the CFO. Now, I happen to be pleasantly proud to have worked for Audax last year. They owned 87 companies. They were on number one on the list in terms of portfolio companies. I mean, that's a lot of CEO churn that they had to change out 87 CEOs, which included me getting plugged in to go do one of those roles. And guess what? I had to change so, you know, some of my players. So I would say not concentrate on the sexy ones that make the headlines. I would spend more time thinking about the ones uh, that do more transactions because that's likely to be, you know, where there's going to be uh, more activity. Now, I want to spend one second, because we've only got a couple of minutes left here, and there are a couple of yeah. questions that I haven't answered, Matt. Uh, and I would say, uh, Matt, if I can go to slide, uh, and I just can't page forward here fast enough. Give me a second, and I will. Okay, uh, slide 35. Uh, my single piece of counsel, other than tuning up your LinkedIn profile, if we could go to 37, would be do not be the attorney who represents himself. And we've all heard the expression, an attorney who represents himself is a fool. I would say the same is true with your personal career. Uh, have a professional do your LinkedIn profile. Have a professional do your resume. Have your professional do your bio. I've worked with several over my 30 or 40 years. Uh, the person that I use, I'm sharing with you here on this slide, Karen Kirpin, is top of the top of all of the ones that I have worked with. She does all of my personal work now. I don't use anybody else. She does my resume. She does my bio. Uh, and she actually took this PowerPoint presentation when she saw I was going to go do it and tuned it up and made it a lot better than what it is. Her contact information is here. She is a 12 uh, on a scale of one to 10. So uh, that's one point that I wanted to make that. Now, yeah. there was one question that I, I didn't answer, and it was from Tom, uh, and it made me smile. Uh, so I want to just... Pull yeah, up as the a hard CFO, copy. you're you're sometimes asked to come up with the data that you know has no value. Yeah, I think that's really yeah. the point. So, Tom Lewis, question. if you're still here, raise your hand, Tom, so I could see you in the gallery. Hi, hi, Mike. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm, I'm off off camera, but uh, yeah, okay. here. Okay. Okay. All right. But you're here. But I gotta say. Your question totally brought a smile to my face. So for everybody else's benefit, Tom's question, which he wrote in is, does private equity measure everything useless and nothing useful? And I got, I, I this absolutely made my day. And he went on to say, my experience is that we measure all sorts of useless financial metrics, balance sheet, cash flow, and fail to measure value at creating activities like uh, deal velocity, 
uh, brand value. <laughs> I, you know, I would say that my answer to your question, Tom, and I'm so proud that you were able and bold enough uh, to raise that and send that to Matt uh, and uh, to me, uh, is that uh, I'm going to give you a harsh conclusion. You, you, you know, we, you're, working, you're working with the wrong private equity firm. I mean, if you don't value their values on what the right measures are, you know, and I've worked with several micromanagers. I'm going to end on one point, Matt, and then leave the two minutes to you. One of the best private equity, I'm sorry, uh, PepsiCo offsites we did with the seven presidents. Uh, we had a moderator who was phenomenal. And he went up to the whiteboard and he wrote on the whiteboard 10.01. 10.01. And he just he, he, he left that on the whiteboard and then just stared at us and didn't say anything. So we were all wondering where he was going. And then he went on to say, are you working on the correct side of the decimal point? Meaning, are you working on the 10 side or are you working on the 0.01 side? So Tom, when I read your, read your email, which really uh, brought a smile to my face. And I'm glad you were courageous enough to send it in. You know, I, I would say that that's probably the biggest key in PE is to make sure you're working on the 10 side, not the 0.01 side, which means the 100 day plan. Uh, and I think Matt, that kind of sums up everything that I can convey to an audience about private equity. Yeah, I think as a CFO, your responsibility is to understand the metrics of the business and educate all the people around you as to what, what is really driving the business. Uh, I had, uh, uh, when I was chief financial officer of an advertising agency, my, my boss thought you could take business at any price and do great advertising and uh, make a fortune. And I said, yeah, you got to do great advertising. That is important. But the reality of the business was that uh, unless you took business at a profit, you never made any money on these people. Yeah. Going in, so, you had to understand what your costs were. And uh, that yeah. was not a strong thing in the organization when I joined. So I guess, Matt, my concluding three points would be help your CEO be that person's wing person. Deliver the 100-day plan, number one. Uh, number two, uh, as a potential candidate, work on your LinkedIn profile. Most people have no idea how important that is. Number three, have your material professionally prepared. Don't be the sour um, uh, attorney that makes the mistake of representing himself. Have it professionally prepared. You've got Karen Kirpin's uh, contact info. Um, so that would be my conclusion, Matt, but I'm open to anything you would like to do. Sure. Well, we have a few more minutes. We can, are there any more, are there questions? We had to convey a lot of information, so I apologize. We didn't leave a lot of time, but, uh, Mike, uh, I'm sure we'll hang out for a few more minutes if you have good questions. Yeah, I, I already asked the ones that were in the chat room, so you don't have to worry. Yeah. And if anybody, so anybody wants to email me and Matt, uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to respond. Uh, just give me 24 hours. Yeah, but you have Mike's contact information and he's, he's opening, open to you uh, reaching out to him on LinkedIn. Oh, please, 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 please. I'm glad you mentioned that. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I am a super connector, as it's called, meaning I've got 9,000 contacts. Simply being connected with me will raise you in your rankings in LinkedIn by simply being connected to me because of my connection base. So if nothing else, send me- right, but, but let me just qualify. Yeah, they have to send you a personal note. They can't yeah. use a system message. Yeah, yes. But uh, just put in the subject line, F-E-N-G, and I will accept. And I heard your presentation. Otherwise, he won't take, take your LinkedIn connection. Okay, I put Karen's information. Somebody asked for that. It's in the chat room. Okay, so if you save so the people, chat, you'll have people, it. People can, thank you, Peggy. People can copy it. Are there any other questions? We've exhausted Mike. We've ran him, ran him through a two-hour presentation <laughs> in 60 minutes. 
Matt, it's always fun working with you and Good Pinky. Job, Mike. You, 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 you two are the best. I just you're the you're the best tag team I've ever worked with. <laughs> we we try our best. A anybody have any other questions? Well, I just if not, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us on Chat with Matt. I don't know if I can wave my magic wand hard enough to come up with somebody better than Mike, but we're I I, I always keep trying. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for giving of your time. Uh, sometime in September, I believe, we're gonna we'll do another presentation on getting board seats. That's Mike's other um, uh, area of expertise. Uh, Mike does have coaching services. You can go out to his. Uh, you have a website, Mike? Pastorlandings.com. I put that in already. I already Good. put it in. Yeah, so Pastorlandings.com. Professional com. coaching services. He would be willing to do it for you if you cross his palm with silver. So fast, fast, faster learning, I put faster fa landings, landing, faster faster landings. Land with an F, right? Think, faster. Think, think pilot, faster landing, faster landing. I put that in. It's already in the chat room. Oh, great. Good. Good. So we'll, 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 we'll end now and thank Mike for all of his uh, time and expertise. Uh, and uh, we'll see you again on uh, chat with Matt. So, thank you. Mike.